Now, how many of you have heard of the Bhagavad Gita? Wonderful, wonderful. I'd like to read to you um, what some great thinkers of the world say about it. Uh, for me, I have two Bibles <laughs> that help me through my life. One is the Bhagavad Gita, and actually it's called the Living Gita, translated by my master, Sri Swami Sachdananda. And I choose it because it's very 21st century, and I think we need to go with the times. The deep, deep teachings need to be brought into today's times. Otherwise, there's no use. You can't make sense of them. We have to apply them to our lives. That's what spirit is about. The teachings are not about intellectualism. They're not. They're about living. Living your life the best you can. And sometimes, guess what, guys? Battles come to us. Now, how to face those battles. So I'm going to read to you uh, my, my two Bibles. This one and the Yoga Sutras of Sri Patanjali, which Shanti was speaking about the course in January. So this is from Mahatma Gandhi. All of you know Gandhi? The Bhagavad Gita's emphasis on selfless service was a prime source of inspiration for Gandhi. Gandhi told when doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face, and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, I turn to the Gita and find a verse to comfort me. And I immediately begin to smile in the midst of overwhelming sorrow. Those who meditate on the Gita will derive fresh joy and new meanings from it every single day. Swami Vivekananda. Any of you heard of Swami Vivekananda? Mm -hmm. Well, please read him. Anybody who's in yoga or mind stuff, read Swami Vivekananda. He was the first one to bring yoga to the West. And he attended the World Parliament, the Parliament of World Religions. And his story is phenomenal. So read it. He, he's quite... Um, Swami Vivekananda is quite dynamic. You know, he's very scientific. And he speaks very powerfully. Even his books, they're very powerful. And he's kind of the Swami, I don't take any nonsense, you know. Just get to it. Find God, divine, universe, whatever you want to call it. Just find it, you know. Don't waste your time. Life is too short. Find yourself. So uh, that's Swami Vivekananda. And he says... Swami Vivekananda invents much interest in the Bhagavad Gita. It is said, Bhagavad Gita was one of his two most favorite books. The other one was The Imitation of Christ. In 1888-1893, when Vivekananda was traveling all over India as a wandering monk, he kept only two books with him, Gita, Imitation of Christ. Aldous Huxley. The English writer found the Gita the most systematic statement of spiritual evolution of endowing value to mankind. He also felt Gita is one of the most clear and comprehensive summaries of philosophy ever revealed, hence its enduring value is subject not only to India, but to all of humanity. I'm just going to read you one more. I mean, I just loved what they said, because I just love the Gita. And for me, it's, you know, really, as they say, throughout my life, whenever in doubt, the Gita and the Sutras have just helped me through the most difficult moments. Sunita Williams, an American astronaut who holds the record for the longest single space flight by a woman, carried a copy of Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads with her to space. <laughs> Those are spiritual things to reflect upon yourself, life, world around you, and see things another way. I thought it was quite appropriate while taking my time in space. <laughs> and then Rudolf Steiner, you know the Steiner schools? If we want to approach such a creation, 
as sublime, as sublime as the Gita, with full understanding, it is necessary for us to attune our souls with it. And uh, if you want this, I can give it to you. Yeah, it's just lovely about the Gita. So you can have it. Yeah, thank you, Laurie, for inviting me to your center. So, uh, as you requested, requested, I will give you the background of the Gita. So, what is this Gita that everybody speaks about and talks about, which is taught in universities such as Oxford and Cambridge? It gets to the depth of the human soul. You know, it, it cuts away all the uh, artificiality of spirituality and gets into the depth of spirituality. Today we have a lot of artificiality in spirituality. What, what do I mean by that? It's a lot of people seem to know the right words to say, or, you know, oh, we're all one, you know, we love each other. Yeah, and then next minute their friend does, says one thing, so small, you know, I don't like the way you look, or why did you do this, and there's World War Three. So it's, what I'm saying, it's worthy. It's worthy. It's not, that will never give you, the intellectual knowledge will not give you the essence of the soul. You have to go really deep. And the battles that come to us in our life is really what makes us think. It's really what makes us observe, you know, what, I'm not the only one suffering in this world. Everybody is suffering. And with the spiritual aspect, what is this teaching me? How do I approach this war? Why do I have to go to war? The Bhagavad Gita is not a, 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 a description of going into war. It's a description of everybody's life. We all have small little walls in our life. It's an analogy. It helps us to understand, you know, why we go through certain things and how and how to ride the storm. How to ride the storm. For me, this is the biggest present. Storms we all have. So it is really up to you. All I can do is impart information. All I can do is tell you to try, you know? Uh, you know, in Sri Patanjali, the other uh, text I talk about, it says, if you are going through pain in your life, one of the practices that you should do is swadhyaya. What does swadhyaya mean? Swadhyaya means study of spiritual texts. Old is gold, my master used to say. <laughs> old is gold because the old texts are uh, comes from the soul because in those days they didn't have other people's material to read. They didn't have so much stuff that other people had to write. They had to listen. Uh, uh, you know, the Bhagavad Gita is known as a Shruti. S-H-R-U-T-I. What is a Shruti? A Shruti is um, scripture that one heard. They learned through hearing. So it went deep into their souls. They didn't have books. It is only much later on that because we were becoming more dense and more materialistic that we could not hold this information anymore. Our brains couldn't have the capacity and we lost the capacity of love and heart chakra. We became more head chakra, you know, and base chakra. We started working more with our um, muladhara chakra because we wanted things as... Fortune became more available to more people than material things became more important to us rather than our soul. So that's Shruti, that's the Gita. So the background of the Gita is very simple. It's a beautiful story. It comes from what we call the Mahabharata. Any of you heard about the Mahabharata? Okay, just a few of you, Google it when you go home. Maha means great, Bharat means kingdom of the divine. Okay, uh, the Bhagavad Gita is also known as the heavenly song or the song of God, whatever you want to call it, because it's written in verses. It consists of 18 chapters and each verse is filled with dynamism. I'll read you a few if we have time. You know, so 
The Mahabharat is like the Old Testament. Lots of stories of what happens to people in lives. You know, it touches magic, it touches curses, it touches uh, negative things, it touches positive things, and it touches all the stories that go along with us life, with uh, you know, on this life. It touches how when we focus on the divine energy or the higher self, how we can come out of our struggles, and those who don't suffer greatly. So, in the middle of the Mahabharata is what they call an Upanishad, or a Vedda. Sorry, I'm being so technical, but it's important, you know, because it's a very important text. So, Vedda means, Vedda means knowledge, spiritual knowledge that was given from the beginning of time. So you all heard, and most of you have heard the word Vedanta. Vedanta is from the Vedas, and it means the end of all knowledge. So when you experience the divine in you, the knowledge becomes not important anymore. It doesn't matter anymore. Scriptures become useless when you already know the truth. And the Bhagavad Gita says, just as, you know, uh, Rainfall is not necessary when you have a full reservoir. <laughs> so a person who already is full with his knowledge of the higher self and divine does no longer need any of this because the knowledge becomes you. But until you get to that point, reading is important. And when you read, you read verse by verse, it's very deep. I would suggest you don't touch chapter one because lots of Indian names and quite difficult. So I'm going to explain up to chapter two so you can start with chapter two. So here is the Mahabharata. And it goes through the generations and suddenly you have this king. There are two brothers. One is called Dhritarashtra, you don't have to remember the names, and the other one is Pandu. Dhritarashtra is a blind king. And look at the symbolism behind the stories. Blind. You can't see too well. What aren't you looking at in your life? Oh, I'm not seeing things clearly. It means mentally you're not seeing things clearly as well. Spiritually, you're not seeing things clearly. These are the outer signs for inner growth. So anyway, the blind king. And Pandu, his brother, was called the white-skinned king. Now, Again, analogy, white, clear, pure, okay? Pure mind. And dark doesn't mean evil. It just means you cannot see the truth. So these two brothers, they had two separate kingdoms. Now, um, Dhritarashtra had a hundred sons, probably lots of mistresses, right? In those <laughs> days, kings did that. So, I mean, I don't know how else you could have a hundred sons. <laughs> so, and... Um, Pandu had two wives and only five sons. Now, each of those sons, uh, because um, Pandu was married to a very spiritual woman called Kunti, and the second wife was Madri. And Kunti always, from a young child, always prays, Pray to the divine. You know, if I have child, let the sun god give me a child. Let this god give me a child. Let my child be endowed with, with uh, all the holy qualities. So she had five beautiful sons that were endowed with generosity, love, uh, intelligent. Um, they were great warriors, because in those days they had to train, like even the royal family, right? <laughs> when you have that kind of status in life, you have to go to the military, you have to, you have to train because you have to protect your country. That is the job. So they were highly, highly qualified. Now, uh, so were the hundred sons. But what happened was, Pandu died suddenly. Now, in the Indian tradition, when the husband dies, then the wife and her children has to move to the another male, any male party that is a father-in-law, whatever it is, because um, women cannot bring up children on their own. That was the law of the community in those days, right? So she moved her sons into Drita Rashtra's court. 
So of course there they were trained by different gurus, teachers. What does the word guru mean? Guru means one who removes darkness. So in those days, all people who dealt with royalty had to learn the spiritual values of life too. So every guru, uh, every trainee, for example, um, the teacher who taught them about being warriors, he had to be endowed with all the knowledge of the scriptures because he didn't only had to teach statesmanship or uh, the ability to be, to, to be a great archer, but he had to teach it with spiritual background. For example, you don't hurt anyone unless they attack you. You know, like you have the martial arts today, Martial arts is based on the same thing. It is not taught because they, you want to attack people. Well, many of you have seen the films, what is it called, Karate Kid? <laughs> any of you seen Karate Kid? Yeah. So you see the good side and the bad side of any spiritual teaching. It can be misused or used for the right purposes. Right? So this was the same teaching. So anyway, this teacher taught in the court. And what happened was... Jealousy arose because these five kids were so much better than the hundred boys. Soon they developed great jealousy. There was great rivalry because all the teachers that came to the court just fell in love with the five brothers. Not because they were clever or intelligent, but because they were wonderful and grateful and generous and kind. They had all these wonderful qualities. So what happened was, as they didn't get along, they divided the property into half, the kingdom into half. And then, because the sons were now growing up, so uh, Dhrita Rasha said, you run your half of the kingdom, which belonged to your father. Now you're grown up. I don't need to look after you. And my sons will have the other half of the kingdom. So then what happens? Their part, the elder son is of the five Pandus, was called Drita Rastra, I mean, sorry, Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira. So Yudhishthira was loved by everyone. And, and so what happened is their whole community started to grow. People moved from all the villages. They wanted to live in this kingdom where there was joy and peace and um, it was abundant. It was abundant. They had everything. Because you know the law of life is you give, you get back. You love, you get love back. Right? As you sow, you reap. So this is the way the five brothers um, ran the kingdom. They looked after the poor, they looked after the sick, and the jealousy rose more and more because everybody was, oh, you Dishtra and his brothers, Bhima is so strong, Arjuna is the greatest archer of all. And now the jealousy got worse and worse. So now I'm going to stop here a minute before I continue with the story. The analogy here, our minds. Normally, we have a hundred negative thoughts and five good thoughts. <laughs> and the yoga practice is to learn to focus on our five great qualities and not on the hundred negative negativities in our life. Because if you go through a day and you're honest with yourself, there's lots of things that will make you feel negative. Lots of thoughts. We're always prone to complaining. Oh, this is too hot. <laughs> Isn't it true? And then winter comes, it's too cold, it's this, it's that, it's that. That's not good enough. This is not good enough. If you listen to yourself over the day, oh my God, there's a hundred negative compared to the five joyful and wow, I'm so glad I'm alive. Oh, I just tripped and felt bad. Karma gone. <laughs> you know? But we seem to always focus on what is not so good in our life and then what happens? Because you focus on the negative as you think. You tell me, what happens? So it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, we need to watch those thoughts in our mind. We need to observe them every day. And this is why we do the practice of meditation. And this is how the Pandus ran the kingdom. 
And people just felt good. Can you imagine when you live like that, the energy in your home, it becomes very powerful. And when the energy in your home becomes very powerful, that's why they say, starts at home, starts at home, starts at home, charity starts at home. When the energy in your home becomes powerful, all the gods in the Bhagavad Gita will tell you that. Come to help you. In whatever work you do in life, they almost like you get help. Yes, you get lots of tests as well. But then when you have the knowledge, you no longer see your, 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 the pain in your life as anything horrible, but as a test to show if you're strong enough to serve the way. That's all. Your, your, I, the way you look at it changes. You totally change. It's a consciousness shift from being the victim to be the hero, heroine, you know? And some, somebody said to me the other night, you've gone through so much the last few years, I didn't realize. And I go, no, 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 don't make me a victim. <laughs> <laughs> I chose in this life to be a heroine. I don't want to be a victim. I choose that, I choose that. Because when I'm a victim, I lose time on earth. And now time is short. Uh, but if I'm a heroine, I can help so many other people and gain time. Whatever I do with my time, at least when the moment of death comes, I can say, I did my best. Goodbye, world. I'm, I don't belong here anyway. Do you belong here? None of us. Can you say that loud and clear? <laughs> no, we don't belong here. We're all alone. <laughs> and then people come to me like, oh, we could have called. This is, we're all going to go there. We better learn to cope. We better learn it now. And then when I explain, you have to go through the pain. But let us find peace in the pain. You have to go through pain in life. I'm sorry. And this is what Arjuna had to do. He had to go through this war. He did not want it. He never asked for it. We never ask for pain, but when it comes, boy, should we know, may we have the tools to go through it with peace at least. Because that's all we can do. You it just can't run away, it's there. But the way you look at it, and while you're going through the pain, while you're going through the pain, you are growing spiritually. Why? How? Every person I know who understood their pain spiritually has come out the other end as kings and queens. I call them kings and queens of the earth because what they have done is give back to the world. They have now understood compassion because they've gone through it. They have dropped bitterness. Their lives become useful instead of filling it with complaints as they did before they had the tragedy. After the tragedy and during the, the period of the tragedy, many realizations come. If you have the spiritual practice, you can do it. You can do it. You can take the bad days. You can cry in the bad days and take it. You don't feel like, oh, I need a tablet. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I can't do this. This anxiousness that everybody's feeling today. You can do it. Everybody can. We just have to remember we are strong because we are not physical. We are spiritual. And spirituality is a power. And why do you meditate? To connect with that great universal power, which we call God or whatever you want to call it. I'm really not bothered about names. But there is an energy and it's dynamic and it is love and it is full of vibration. It is full of light. And you know it because as you do more and more and more, you yourself become happier and happier and lighter and lighter. But it takes time. The first step is see what's wrong. Go through the battle. You have to battle. I'm sorry, there are no shortcuts. All this business of, you know, come and Kundalini in three days and you'll be enlightened. Good luck to you. <laughs> Good luck to you. You become disillusioned. You become angry. And many people have done that. They've gone to these workshops. Three days, you will have everything you have. And da da da. Oh, you need to live a good life. As if that it's that easy. If you want to play the piano, you have to practice every day, don't you? We have to practice. And what are you practicing? Being with yourself? Being with what we call God or divine energy? Being with your soul? Because that's who you are. You are soul and spirit. This we know. A hundred percent is going to go. A hundred percent. So let us focus more time on us. And then when your spirit is light and joyful and full of this power, there's much you can do. 
And you know the much you can do is peace in your life. And actually when you get in the peace in your life, you don't want to do much. <laughs> I promise you that. I prom this is the dilemma of the spiritual person. You really don't want to do much, but that's when you're called to do everything. <laughs> So people will ask, may I be used? Careful. We will totally be used again and again and again. And you do more work with love, the more you will be used. So, uh, but then you, it changes because then you lose you. You lose your big ego that I talked about. And then you realize that everybody is equal to you. That you are no different to anybody else. You know, I always tell people, we're all going to end up in a box. What makes me better than you? Nothing. 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 It's a fallacy that some people are better than other people. What a lot of nonsense. Some people may have more knowledge. Some people may be more developed, but better? No. Oh, what's keeping the difference is just the lack of information. That's all. So when you seek spiritual information, I, I advise you all, seek it. Seek it, seek it, seek it. And where do you seek it? From within you. When you develop all those great five qualities, hmm? goodness, kindness, generosity, and learn to be strong, because Arjuna is the warrior. 